Alright, what's up everybody? How's everyone doing out there today? Welcome back to Wildcat MTG, and welcome to the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth pre-release weekend. Um, I know that I'm pretty fired up about getting to crack some of this product open and play some of these uh, pre-release events. Uh, today, today I want to talk about my top 10 cards, the cards I am most excited about. Um, as kind of a reminder, I've done a bunch of these now, and maybe you've heard some of these before, or maybe if you're new to, to doing these, I do my top 10 a little bit differently. Um, I'm not so focused on top 10 valuable cards. I'm not top, so focused on uh, top 10 most powerful cards. I think that is completely subjective to the format. Um, so, you know, my top 10 is going to be a little bit different. I'm really talking about the, the top 10 cards that I personally am most excited to get a chance to play with in this uh, from this new set. Um, I should also state that since this uh, set also does have box toppers in there that I'm not going to include anything that could be found as a box topper. Um, obviously, that'd be pretty easy to just say, oh, you know, I'm really excited to play with Ancient Tomb or, you know, the Great Hand. So none of the top 10 cards, my top 10 cards that I'm excited about uh, will be anything that appears in the box topper slot. Um, yeah, you know, that's kind of how I like to do my top 10. Again, these cards that I, I'm excited about, I encourage you to, to, to leave comments about the cards that you're most excited about playing with. Um, and with that being said, why don't we go ahead and jump on in and start talking about these. Coming in hot at number 10, I have Fiery Inscription. Uh, this is a three drop red enchantment um, and it reads, when Fiery Inscription enters the battlefield, the ring tempts you. Uh, when you cast an instant or sorcery spell, Fiery Inscription deals two damage to each opponent. So we, we've seen this effect before. This is most notably Gutter Snipe, right? Uh, which is a 2-2 creature that, that does this exact same thing minus the ring attempting to tempt you. Uh, I'm not quite sure what to make of the ring tempts you mechanic yet. I'm very interested intrigued to see how far that goes, if that's actually competitively good. Um, but I know that I like the idea that whenever I cast an instant or sorcery spell, the fire inscription deals two damage to each opponent, right? And so I know a lot of people argue, you know, uh, they would rather have the creature over the enchantment because it's affecting board state a little bit more. For me, I think this is just redundancy if you're running, especially in some sort of commander deck that wants to be spell slinging and punishing people with a gutter snipe. Fire inscription is just adding another layer to that. Um, and heaven forbid you should have both of these on the battlefield. I really like this card. I'm intrigued to see where the ring tempts you thing goes. Um, but again, just, you know, as a card that I think has really good playability and I think add some redundancy to those type of decks that want to use this card, um, I think it's going to be very cool to play with. Next up at number 9, I have Mirkwood Bats. This is a 4 casting cost that's 3 colorless and 1 black mana, 2-3 flyer, and it reads, whenever you create or sacrifice a token, each opponent loses a life. And the thing you need to understand is this card is not mythic, it is not rare, it is not uncommon, it is a common as I, a common that whenever you create or sacrifice a token, and it doesn't care what type of token it is, food, clue, creature, doesn't matter. Whenever you create or sacrifice it, each opponent loses a life. Uh, when this card was first brought to my attention, I actually thought it was like a, a fake card. I'm like, oh, this card's make-believe, cute. Uh, no, that's a real card. Uh, so, so obviously this card has a ton of possibilities, right? You can apply it to a lot of different strategies as long as you're, as long as you're playing black, you know, uh, commander strategies that want to be burning and creating tokens. It is very, very abusable. I think this card is going to see a ton of play. I know I can't wait to do some fairly degenerate things with it. It's a win con in and of itself. Uh, and it's common. <laughs> Ta-da! Mirkwood Bats number nine. Uh, I think the card kind of speaks for itself, but yeah, I'm excited to play with it. Moving on to number 8, I have Press the Enemy. Press the Enemy is a 4 casting cost blue instant. That's 2 colorless and 2 blue mana. And it reads, return target spell or non-land permanent an opponent controls to its owner's hand. You may cast an instant or sorcery spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost. Um, this spell's pretty intriguing to me. I, I think it's kind of cool because uh, while it's a little bit heavy-handed on, on the mana value side, it does cost 4 mana. I like that it's doing multiple things. Um, a, you can play it at instant speed, right? And it's allowing me to either return a spell that's probably that's on the stack or a non-land permanent that's already on the battlefield an opponent controls to its owner's hand. So you're getting that value from it right away. And then secondarily, you can cast an instant or sorcery spell. So allowing you to play sorcery spells effectively at instant speed with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying that that the mana cost. That's pretty cool, right? And you might not always get like a maximum value. Maybe you're only the permanent you're bouncing is maybe only a couple of mana. It's two or three mana, but allowing you to return something that's on the battlefield already, which is sometimes hard for blue because once it slips past the, the counter spell shield, 
Blue doesn't have the greatest ways to get rid of something. It's usually bouncing something, but that's okay. It's at least bouncing something, and it's not absorbing all of your mana. It's allowing you to still play a spell that you would have loved to have played on your opponent's turn anyway. I think this is a really cool spell. I don't know how much, you know... I don't know how much play it's going to see, especially since Lord of the Rings is a modern set. I don't know that this is going to make any cuts in a modern deck, but at least certainly from a commander standpoint, I could see this card seeing a decent amount of play. I think it's very cool. So uh, yeah, number eight, I have pressed the enemy. All right, moving on to number seven, we have Flowering of the White Tree. This is a two casting cost. That's double white pip, legendary enchantment that reads legendary creatures you control get plus two plus one and have ward one and non-legendary creatures you control get plus one plus one. Now, um, Anthem effects as we now call them, right? Kind of named after Glorious Anthem, which we'll get to in a second. But these these effects that pump your creatures or pump creatures have been around since the beginning of Magic. Uh, Bad Moon gives all black creatures plus one plus one, and it was only two mana, but the drawback was it gave all black creatures, not just your creatures, right? So if your opponent was playing black creatures, they were getting the benefit of the effect of the pump as well, which is not always ideal. So later on, we got Glorious Anthem, which is kind of now just known as anytime you have these spells or, or abilities or enchantments or whatever that are, are buffing creatures. Um, we just call them Anthem Effects. Well, it's kind of named after Glorious Anthem, which was a three casting cost uh, enchantment, but it at least held it so that it was all of your creatures and your opponents weren't getting any benefit off of it. So we've kind of come a long way in that we now have an enchantment that is only two mana that's also buffing specifically your creatures, giving them at least one plus one plus one. And if they happen to be legendary, it's giving them plus two plus one and ward one, which is absolutely huge. Now, the sort of immediate drawback with this card is that it's a legendary enchantment, so if you're playing Constructed, it's going to be tougher to fit more than one or two in there anyway because it's it's a legendary enchantment. You don't want to get caught with a bunch in your hand. I don't know how much Constructed play Anthems really see nowadays anyway, but you know, even though it's the easy answer, I see that the best fit for this being in Commander, um, where the legendary part doesn't even matter because you can only run one in your deck anyway, and I think that has a lot of applications. You know, Obviously, it's going to be pumping your Commander, but there are strategies out there decks that are running you know just a ton of legendary creatures and for two mana uh giving all your legendary creatures that ward one and that buff i think is a huge deal i think that this is going to have some potential in a, in a bunch of different shells and i'm interested to see what people do with it but it's a card that i think is very cool all right, so I like my red enchantments, right? So uh, coming in at number six, I have Fall of Care Andros, and uh, I'll go ahead and apologize to my Lord of the Rings fans out there if I've mispronounced that, but uh, this is a three mana value red enchantment that is two colorless and one red mana, and it reads, whenever a creature an opponent controls is dealt excess non-combat damage, amass orcs X, where X is that excess damage. Um, and then additionally, you can pay seven colorless and uh, one red to activate and uh, Fall of Care Andros deals seven damage to target creature. All right, so let's talk about the first part real quick. So Amass has been, we've seen Amass before. Uh, this came out of War of the Spark and it was used to, you know, for zombies in, in War of the Spark. And Amass basically says that whenever X event happens, right, the first time you Amass, if you don't have that creature already, in this case, orcs, you get an orc. But instead of at, at that, any additional time you Amass beyond that, you're not getting additional creatures you're just growing the same creature and bigger and bigger and bigger so in this case if you were to deal uh excess damage to a creature of five the f and you don't already have an orc on on the field you would then get the orc the first time and then all the excess would just basically grow and grow that particular orc so it's making one giant creature right and what I like about this is that, you know, for all of uh, Red's direct damage that it has always had and, and continues to have, whether it's lightning bolts or, or shocks or whatever else, um, I like that it's putting that excess combat damage to use by giving you a body and then potentially giving you the biggest body on the field. Um, I know that, again, this is a modern set and it's going to be hard to determine how many of these cards are playable uh, in actually playable in modern but i love the idea and it's probably a little slow for modern but i still like the card that uh for my burn decks i could be actually getting excess value because if i do have to burn creatures on the battlefield i'm at least getting a body back for it as well uh and a potential threat so uh you know I like this card. I think it's cool. I think the secondary ability of paying eight mana to deal seven damage to target creature is probably a little impractical. I don't think you're using it that often, but just having a, a passive effect on the battlefield where for all the non-combat damage I'm doing to my opponent's creatures, I'm getting something back for it. I like that. The number five card on my list is Lobelia Sackville Baggins. This is a three casting cost. That's two colorless and one black mana, two, three, legendary halfling citizen creature that has flash and menace and it reads when Lobelia Sackville Baggins enters the battlefield 
Exile target creature card from an opponent's graveyard that was put there from the battlefield this turn, then create X treasure tokens where X is the exiled creature's power. Now, um, I think this card is, is very cool. It's opportunistic. Um, I like that. Uh, it has the ability to, of course, exile a creature from, from your opponent's graveyard, which is usually a good thing. And then on top of that, you're capitalizing and getting rewarded by getting treasure tokens back where X, the number of treasure tokens is equal to that creature's power. Um, it also says as condition is that the creature just has to have put there from the battlefield this turn. So if you have more than one creature that has been put in your opponent's graveyard, now you can't use the same creature over and over again because you're exiling that creature. But if you have multiple creatures that have been put in your opponent's graveyards that turn and you have the ability to either blink or flicker Lobelia, you have the ability then to exile multiple creatures from your opponent's graveyards and, and quite literally get rewarded with treasure for your efforts. Um, I don't know if this is broken or busted or anything along those, those lines, but just the, again, ability to take away potential threats, recursion threats from your opponents, and also capitalize on them by getting treasure, which may allow you to ramp, I think that's pretty neat. Um, even as a one-time use, this card has some, some utility to it, um, especially with that flash built into it. So I, I think this card is, is definitely good to see some play. I know I'm going to end up throwing in a few decks and seeing if I can cause some mayhem with it. At number four, I have Aragorn the Uniter, and I think this card is really sweet. Uh, so this is a four casting class that's red, green, white, and blue for a 5-5 five, five creature. So automatically right off the bat, it's, it's four for a 5-5, five, five, which is already above the curve. Now, this card does a whole host of things, so bear with me here. Whenever you cast a white spell, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. Whenever you cast a blue spell, scry 2. Whenever you cast a red spell, Aragorn the Uniter deals 3 damage to target opponent. Whenever you cast a green spell, target creature gets plus 4, plus 4 until end of turn. So if you cast a red spell, it does that one thing. If you cast a spell that is red and green, it does both of those things. Uh, that means if you cast a, a, a spell that is all four of those colors, it is doing all four of those things. That is a uh, triggers galore. Um, uh, this card just does so much. It has so much value that I, I'm even curious. And again, you know, I'm not going to say I'm a modern pro. I, I'm definitely not. I play very casually modern, but I kind of wonder if this card has some legs to it in modern because it just does so much. It's creating bodies. It's damaging your opponent. It's pumping your creatures, scrying. Um, I definitely, obviously, the obvious application is that this will be a very popular commander. That is that is a given. Um, but I'm just curious at 4 for a 5-5 five, five with all the things that it does. Now, it doesn't really draw cards. Scrying is pretty close. That's kind of like the one thing it feels like it's missing. But other than that, I mean, again, creating bodies, damaging your opponents, and uh, and also pumping, you, pumping your creatures. Uh, this card does so much that I, I can't imagine this card won't be very, very popular. So, uh, yeah, Aragorn the United, uh, the Uniter. Uh, this card is just beastly. All right, so here we have it. We've hit our top three. And at number three, I have Sauron the Dark Lord. So Sauron is a six mana that is three colorless, one blue, one black, and one red for a 7-6. Okay, pretty decent. Six for a 7-6. Uh, it has Ward. Ward says sacrifice a legendary artifact or legendary creature. So your opponent has to sacrifice a legendary artifact or legendary creature just to be able to target Sauron to begin with. All right, pretty good. And then whenever an opponent casts a spell, whenever an opponent casts a spell, amass orcs one. So every spell your opponent casts, that's not just instants or sorceries, that's not creatures, that's literally every spell you're amassing. Pretty good. Whenever an army you control deals combat damage to a player, the ring tempts you. Okay. And then lastly, when the ring tempts you, you may discard your hand if you do draw four cards. Now, sort of the X factor here for me is, again, I'm not sure how much the, the ring tempting us is, is going to come into play, mechanically speaking. Like, I'm not sure how much it's going to see play, but this card has all sorts of protections built into it, all sorts of things it does. Uh, right off the bat, the ward of having to sacrifice a legendary artifact or a legendary creature, that is not an easy condition to meet. So aside from the normal board wipes, it's very hard to target this card with targeted removal, and that's assuming you don't also have... Uh, you know, a defense mechanism to even if they get past the ward for you to, to, to put a stop to it. And then whenever your opponent's casting a spell, you're amassing. So again, it's not really a go wide strategy, but it's very easy to see. You might end quickly end up with the, the biggest creature on the board through this. And then uh, if your army of orcs does hit your opponent, uh, then you get the, the, the ring tempting you thing, right? And it does seem that there are enough 
ways to tempt ourselves with the ring that the ability to discard your hand and draw four cards is going to be there. Um, there are some very even inexpensive ways to do it mana value wise. So I think Sauron is actually secretly like a, well, not so secretly, but because it's a mythic, but uh, you know, it, it could be a, like a really, really good card. I'm not really sure, but I love the color combination. I personally love Grixis. It's like my favorite color combination to play. Um, I could easily see this being a commander for me. So that's my number three, Sauron the Dark Lord. So I don't think my number two card is as flashy as Aragorn or Sauron, but that doesn't mean I don't think it's really good. Uh, and it, does, it definitely doesn't mean that I'm not excited to play with it. And, and that's why it's my number two card is I can't wait to get my hands on a bunch of copies of Delighted Halfling. Uh, this is a one for a one, two halfling citizen. You can tap it for a colorless mana, or you can tap it to add one mana of any color, spend this mana only to cast a legendary spell, and that spell can't be countered. Mana dorks have been around since the beginning of Magic, right? Birds of Paradise, Land of War Elves, and a testament to how good those cards are is that they still see play even now in various formats because fast mana is important. Now, on top of that, you know, the reason that fast mana is important and the reason those cards are good is because they're enablers. They allow you to get to bigger spells, bigger, more powerful spells. And so when it comes to enabling, Delighted Halfling kind of has like a little bit of a Cavern of Souls built into it, right? So you can tap it for a mana of any color as long as you're using it to cast, uh, use that mana to cast a legendary spell. And as a nice little bonus there, that spell can't be countered. That is really, really big. And the, side, the, the nice part is, is that, you know, yeah, even if you don't have a legendary spell to cast, you can still get at least a colorless mana out of it. I think this card is very versatile. Um, you know, again, maybe not flashy, but I certainly think effective. And I definitely have plans to have these uh, uh, many copies in, in a bunch of different decks. So that's my number two card, Delighted Halfling. Lord of the Rings must be my red enchantment set because at number one, I have my third red enchantment and my top 10 cards I'm most excited about in Spiteful Banditry. Spiteful Banditry is double red and X. And uh, it's an enchantment that says when Spiteful Banditry comes into battle, the battlefield, it deals X damage to each creature. Whenever one or more creatures your opponents control die, you create a treasure token. This ability triggers only once each turn. So the obvious, the, uh, obvious comparison is to, to Meat Hook Massacre because they have the same casting cost and basically do the same thing upon uh, entering the battlefield. Where they differ is that uh, Meat Hook cares about creatures dying and then gaining you life or, or losing your opponent's life, whereas this is uh, creating treasure tokens. There's also no cap on the Meat Hook Massacre for the number of times it can trigger each turn, whereas with Spiteful Banditry, you can only get one treasure per turn. Um, now... Kind of one thing I'd point out is while Meat Hook Massacre ended up being banned from standard, uh, Spiteful Bandry isn't a, isn't a standard playable card. So I, Meat Hook Massacre doesn't really see any play in modern. So I'm not sure that Spiteful Bandry will either. But I think this is going to be just like Meat Hook Massacre, an incredible commander card. I've heard some people, um, you know, kind of grimace as they saw the ability triggers only once each turn. But if this card triggered for each creature dying that your opponents control uh, it, it would be completely busted i mean we talk about dockside and how quickly it creates treasures this would be very similar level um i think it's a very cool board wipe the fact that it triggers each turn uh once each turn is not to me a huge downside because you can also still cre kill creatures on your differing opponents turns um spiteful banditry is a card that i think is going to see a ton of play i know that i already have some decks in mind for it um and I think, honestly, pairing it even in decks with Meat Hook Massacre is going to be a powerful combination of, of uh, board wiping creatures and making your opponents pay for it while you reap all the benefits. I like this card a whole lot. It is my card I'm most excited about. So that concludes my Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth top 10 cards that I'm most excited about with. Um, you know, admittedly, it was a little bit hard to evaluate knowing that this was a straight to modern set, um, you know, not being able to evaluate cards as a card that I think, oh, this might work well in standard, this standard deck or in this pioneer deck. And, and I don't think, while I think the set is very cool, I don't think it's typically like modern horizons level power. So I'm not sure what sort of impact this is going to have on modern. I definitely know this is going to have a high impact on commander. There's a lot of cards in here that are going to slide right into commander decks. Um, but now I want to hear from you. What are the cards that you're most excited about? Drop me some comments. Let me know. That's going to do it for me today. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. And as always, uh, do me a favor. If you're not subscribed already, hit the subscribe button for me. Hit the like button for me. And by all means, drop me some comments. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you so much, everybody. And be well.